I'd like to welcome you all to the Patch Shop this evening. We're delighted that you are joining us. Uh, in San Diego, when it rains a little bit, sometimes you wonder to what extent you know people are going to leave their homes. But uh, you know, we're glad that you uh, braved the, the, the difficult San Diego weather. Yeah. Uh, <laughs>
Thank you, Miguel. Sure. Exactly. One has to do the stage. But you have to think about the musical background. Please. Basically, I started to play when I was 25 years old. I started. So I studied as an adult. Then I dedicated many, many hours a day for many years. Thank you. Thank you.
at some point, uh, we'll crank up the carousel here and show some slides, just to illustrate a lot of what I've been, what I'm describing. When I was growing up in Washington, D.C., my dad wore a Panama hat. This was just between Memorial Day and Labor Day, and even then with a seersucker suit. <laughs> I always thought the hat came from Panama and the suit came from Sears. <laughs> um, I was wrong on both counts. Uh, the, hat, uh, the, the suit came from a downtown haberdashery, and the hat came from the South American country of Ecuador. Um, Ecuador, then and now, was very much a, a lovely and troubled country that in the 19th century, all the goods from South America first went to the Isthmus of Panama and then were exported to Asia, to North America, and to Europe. So if it was a coat, it might be called a Panama coat because that was the point of sale. If it was a, a bed, a Panama bed, a Panama shirt, and a Panama hat. Um, unlike the other products, though, the name of the hat stuck. And they should have been called Ecuador hats, of course, but um, the, misname, the misnomer stuck, and then it was reinforced during the Spanish-American War in 1898, the U.S. Army purchased 50,000 Ecuadorian straw hats through, uh, through um, I guess through wholesalers, really, in Panama. And so, again, it reinforced the misnomer. When the canal was being built, there's a, some of you may remember, there's a, there's a very famous photograph of Teddy Roosevelt sitting on top of some earth-moving equipment, and he's wearing an Ecuadorian straw hat. But it was at the Panama Canal, it was during the construction of the canal, and that pretty much sealed it, <coughs> as far as the misnomer goes. Um, it, it's, it's really, you know, as far as, as, far as uh, a lot of, you know, as far as Ecuadorians are concerned, it's, it's surprising that anybody can remember where the hat comes from. But these quirky anomalies appeal to me uh, when I do my writing. And for a few years, I was consumed by the Panama hat, by its history, by its lore, by the economic and social and cultural status, by its political role, um, even its geographic travel. And so in 1982, actually, my, my, my personal bank account was pretty much down to seeds and stems. And so I just decided I would leave, you know, I could stay home and just uh, just sort of spend it on normal things, my usual vices, or uh, go to South America. I did not have a book contract. I had done a couple of previous books, but for this I didn't yet have a contract. I spent four months primarily in Ecuador. Um, I lived in... Um, how many were this? Uh, a pie. A pie, Closer? Almost. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> There we are. There's Quito. Thank you. Um, I would live in Quito, but travel throughout the country quite extensively because there were uh, a lot of the uh, the hat industry. Really, Quito has very little to do with it, although it's certainly the, the best known city in the country. Guayaquil, which is not quite on the coast, but is the the primary city in the country, the industrial city, has somewhat more to do with the hats. But most of the hats and the weavers and the straw come from the small towns. I came back, um, I stayed for four months, I came back and I wrote up a book proposal and sent it around. Uh, found a publisher, the William Morrow, which is now part of Harper Collins, as is every house I mean. And in all over three years I spent probably a total of eight or nine months, eight months in Ecuador traveling. I don't think it's overstating the case to say that to understand how a hat makes its way from the straw fields of South America to a shop in Southern California is to understand how the world works. Uh, the hat itself is very innocent, it's non-threatening. I was thinking I was in Ecuador, I could do a, story, do a book even about the petroleum industry, which was doing all sorts of things to the social fabric of the country. But it just seemed much more, um, much more uh, innocent to take the hat and have that be the focus. Uh, at the time, in fact, there was a 
I was I was living in Tucson. There was a professor of creative writing there, a fairly well-known writer at the time, still around, uh, named James Bergele, sort of a, he was a writer in the post-Hemingway era. And I remember very distinctly at a bar called The Shanty, I described for him uh, this idea I had for a book, which was to, to follow the making and marketing from seed to sale of one hat. <coughs> and this was on a Friday afternoon and, and with some graduate students. I wasn't a student then, but I, I would see him every now and then. He said, Miller, a magazine piece may be a book, never. So I had Vance Bergele's, I had that uh, something from him to keep me going. <laughs> um, the book itself has been categorized as travel literature, and I suppose it is. It's, uh, you know, to me, travel literature really has to have a subtext. And writing about the hat certainly has uh, has as much sub as text to it. Travel writing that that just just bobs along and tells you more about the writer than the place uh, doesn't interest me. Um, I'm not a big fan of that kind of writing. But the sad truth is that these days, anybody with a, a laptop computer and frequent flyer miles can call himself a travel writer. So I try to stay away from that as much as possible. The, for me, the best travel writing consists of equal parts curiosity, vulnerability, and vocabulary. I, I, I like to read books that have polemics. I like adversity, prejudice. I like revelation. I like conquest. I like triumph. And all these things can be wrapped up into travel writing. For me, the fellow who I met in Ecuador at the time, since died, Moritz Thompson, for me, he was the great American expat writer of the 20th century. Um, he was sort of a, a uh, in the early 1960s, when he himself was in his early 40s, he joined the Peace Corps. He was a pig farmer in California, not a very good one, but a pig farmer. And he joined, he was just up late one night drunk, as he describes it, and there was a, you know, come see the world, join the Peace Corps. So he did. <laughs> he was assigned to a miserable village in Ecuador. And... He stayed. He served out his two years, re-upped for a third year, and he simply stayed. And he turned out, uh, he stayed until he died about 12 years ago, uh, living in a little hovel in Guayaquil. But he made, most of the time he lived on a farm. He came from an obscenely wealthy family in Seattle and spent most of his life running away from it, really. Um, he was a soft-hearted cuss of a man. He had almost an, almost an insufferable integrity. You know the type of fellow you mean, I mean here. He had a uh, he had three books uh, that are still in print: uh, *Living Poor*, which was about his Peace Corps years, *The Farm on the River of Emeralds*, um, and *The Saddest Pleasure*. That title comes from there's a line from uh, a Paul Theroux novel that says, "Travel is the saddest of pleasures." So he, he took that line and and used it. The, the saddest pleasure embodies uh, it has some of the best elements of travel literature. It has a doubt. It has a meddlesome nature, and it has a disregard for nationalism. Moritz Thompson was a man who really pledged allegiance to nobody and no nation, and he, is, uh, he maintained his station as, a, as an expatriate, and uh, so he was free to judge at all. And he, as much as any other writer, influenced what I was doing in that work. I went to a town called Cariate, um, which is right in this immediate area, just inland from the coast. <clears throat> there are actually two towns I went to to see the straw cutters, those who um, go out once a month, and we'll, I'll show you some slides of them, <laughs> and cut the type of straw, it's called, the, the word for straw is paha, it's a paha tokia. Tokia is a type of straw. As you might expect, within Ecuador, they are not called Panama hats. I think you can get fined for that. <laughs> they, are, uh, they are sombreros de paja de pia. Um, there, for five days every lunar cycle, the straw cutters, the pajeros, in Cariate and in the town of Flores Cordero, they go out into the field and harvest the wild toquilla straw. They do this five days after the waning quarter moon. And they say the straw holds less moisture than they sense. They say it's more pliable, it's easier to weed with, it's easier to cut. Um, I don't know anyone that's proven this, but I don't know anyone who's disproven this either. 
so they've been doing this for generations, actually for centuries. So it, it may be so. There's a um, one of the gypsy ballads by um, Garcia Lorca has a line that the waning moon drapes length, the waning quarter moon drapes lengths of yellow hair. So I've always thought as the the, the straw itself as the yellow hair. And about once every month or so, Garcia Lorca's poem comes alive in towns like Cariate and Cervas Cordero. There, the Panama hat industry in Ecuador has been, well, like the rest of the country's economy, really, but has been suffering greatly, uh, mainly for international market reasons. There is a, an imitation Panama, and most of you, I dare say, wouldn't know the difference. It's called a shantong, which is a made-up word. It's made out of twisted paper uh, from Japan, but made in China. <laughs> What is it? No, this is not. You cannot tell the difference, probably. Um, um, I can decide. The first thing I do when I look at a hat is I just glance at what's called the button, the, in, the uppermost middle section. And each country has its own button. How this tradition got started, who knows? But there's a particular button for Ecuador. The Shantung, because it's not all handmade, it's, uh, some of it is mechanical, does not even have a button, it's just a straight weave. But for all intents and purposes, the Shantung is less expensive, it's more durable, it, it, it holds up well. Um, so, you know, why buy a Panama hat from Ecuador? Why buy a Tokia straw hat when you can buy a Shantung? That's what most of the hat wearers around the world have de determined. And so, the Shantung has cut mightily into the Panama hat tra uh, trade. Also the trail, actually. Uh, the other thing that has affected the hat industry, and still is affecting it, even though it's long over, was El Nino. The, uh, the weather condition along the west coast of South America. Most of the straw and some of the weaving towns are in villages that were severely, if not entirely, inundated by, um, by just waves crashing up through the towns for months and months on end. Uh, this meant that they, people could not get in, people could not get out, the straw couldn't get out. Um, there was no straw to weave hats with for much, much of the rest of the country. And El Nino just, uh, you know, bridges were washed out. It was almost impossible to get to the straw, and if you got there, you couldn't get the straw out to the weavers. Now, I'm going to um, show you on the slide in a little bit uh, the actual straw itself. It grows about 10 feet off the ground and there are the, these thin green prongs at the top. In the town of Cariate, the last town that I visited that has uh, the straw uh, the, the um, straw cutters, there are 12 extended families that are allowed to go out and cut straw. Each one has a certain plot of land, and they are all, all allowed to bring in 1,200 stalks of straw a day. Usually they do this by mule, sometimes by truck. They dry them out on a... Uh, uh, usually they try to find a cloudy day, they put them out to dry, they hang them up. Now, this is in the coastal area. In Cuenca, and in the Andes, it's a whole other, it's the same industry, but it's a very different, um, it's a different procedure. The straw from the coastal area, a lot of it gets trucked from warehouses in Guayaquil up to Cuenca, <coughs> which is a major city. And all the surrounding cities, people come in on straw market day and buy strands of straw. And depending on how sophisticated the hat is that they'll be weaving, they will determine how much straw they need, what quality straw, and how long it will take them, and eventually how much the weaver will be paid for it. The very best straw uh, hat weaver who I met is in a town called Pile, P-I-L-E, very near the coast. Uh, there's a fellow named, uh, his name was, I have it here, um, Jose Rebel Alacon. He, uh, this was four or five years ago. He is reputed to be the best Panama hat weaver in the world. Who knows? He may have some competition, but that's, that's to everybody's best. He only weaves between 7 o'clock and noon every day. He says that the sweat builds up on his fingertips too much in the afternoon to weave. And it takes them about four months to do a hat. Wow. Uh, these are the hats that are called the uh, Monte Cristi Pinos, uh, or 
super pinots and then there are extra pinots. There's all sorts of levels above there, but uh, you're nitpicking when you get beyond that. He now he doesn't just work on one hat for four months. He'll have them in different stages. So maybe every week or two he'll finish one and sell it to middlemen. It goes through a series of middlemen after that. And as in retail sales in this country and every country, the price will double each time. Uh, I, mean, I have seen finished Panama hats in this country on sale in stores for a couple of thousand dollars. At that point, it's at that point it's a piece of art, it's not really an accessory. What is the most you've sold a hat for here? We have Panama's Monte Cristo Panama's on this back wall for as high as eight hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, now that might be the same hat you saw for two thousand dollars. Quite possibly. In the Andes, if you wear a Panama, it identifies you as being a cholo, a non-Indian peasant. And ascendancy from this level of society is almost impossible. A Panama hat identifies you as being among the lowest class. Usually they will wear them, they will be heavily shellacked. Usually somebody will own one for, own three or four of them, and there will always be one or two in a shop being cleaned. And they are usually the Riso weave, which is, this one, is this correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. This is the, this is not quite the... No, but that's the point. This is the point, but this is the Riso weave. This is the Riso's of them. You may see them come up later and look at it. You see a difference in But they will wear it, and uh, usually they're of a slightly tan-colored, and as I said, heavily shellacked. So to, to wear a Panama hat in the Andes really does identify you as being a member of the permanent underclass. To get the respect that it deserves, the Panama hat has to travel north, and it has to cross the equator. It's, um, where's, there's a, an editor, I'm going to get this guy's line. There's a guy, uh, an editor at GQ who I interviewed, but a great line about it. Well, we'll, we'll get to these changes later. The, basically, he's saying that the, um, the Panama hat um, is an accessory for men who don't normally have much to accessorize. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ecuador itself is a country that, uh, you know, <clears throat> the Panama hat might be its, its most popular export. Uh, it's, it's a member of OPEC. It is an oil-producing country. It's uh, Ludwig Bemelmans, who's best known for the children's book, Madeline, wrote, uh, used to write these light-hearted travel logs, and he wrote a book about Ecuador, came out at the beginning of World War II, called The Donkey Inside, in which he made the observation that it has been said of Quito that it has 100 churches and one bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> when I was researching the book, surprisingly, I found a lot of people had that same attitude about the country. There was a fellow in the State Department <laughs> who told me if I, if I promised to keep his name out of it and not use his name, this Ecuador has a severe inferiority complex. <laughs> and uh, this was a State Department under uh, George Bush's father, so it wasn't under a contemporary State Department. <clears throat> when, when the book Panama Hat Trail was launched, we, uh, we launched it at a bookstore in Washington, D.C., in Georgetown, Olson's Books. And there was a nice line there, it was a nice event, and the manager of the store all of a sudden walks up with a very well-dressed man, <coughs> and kind of butts in front of everybody else, and he introduces himself, he's the cultural attaché of the Embassy of Ecuador. And he was there to tell me officially that Ecuador does not have a severe inferiority complex. <laughs> which of course reinforced the notion that it does. <laughs> There is a man in the 1800s uh, in the Panama hat business in Ecuador named Aurelio Ortega. His son, Homero, took over his business, and his daughter, Alicia, now runs the business. It's one of the major exporters in Cuenca. Um, it's a, uh, you know, if one visits Cuenca, it's one of the few hat factories that welcomes outsiders. And they have a little display, I'll, I'll show you a couple slides of it, but they have a display of how the hat is made from beginning to end, and good samples of a lot of the, um, a lot of the hats that they themselves make. Uh, 
the hats go through, the hats go from the weavers to these factories, and there's a whole process. I made a list. They get cleaned, bleached, trimmed, finished, um, what's called treated, shaped, and softened. Softening is done hat by hat by somebody with a hammer. If you hit it too hard, you're going to break the straw. If you hit it too soft, it's not going to take the shape that you want. Each hat goes through this entire process entirely by hand. So, um, it was a, uh, it's, they have at the, the Ortega Hat Factory, they show this entire process going on. The twisted rice paper, that the, the Japanese rice paper that is used for the Shantung, doesn't have any of these problems, which is another reason that they are less expensive and uh, China is much more efficient on the exporting end than Ecuador seems to be. So again, Ecuador takes a beating. There's a, uh, the hat producers, excuse me, I, I got my GQ quote, I'm going to get him right away. Um, said, men are basically locked into a uniform, a watch, cufflinks, accessories, and like that. They can't get too flashy or excessive. A Panama adds a bit of panache to a wardrobe, but falls within what's proper and acceptable. It bumps you up from the norm. So the hat makers have all sorts of, the hat factories have all sorts of problems. Uh, they have the Shantungs, they have El Nino, they have just it's a 19th century industry, and they're facing the 21st century marketplace. <laughs> and they're really not making a whole lot of concessions to the marketplace. One of the things they have done is that there's a unit of the World Trade Organization that serves to protect names that are associated with a place or a product. Champagne. Champagne actually has the protection of the World Trade Organization. You cannot call something champagne unless it actually comes from a certain region of France. Um, you can change the spelling and do that, um, but a number of years ago, Limburger cheese, that's another example, I think. Can someone think of any of the others? There, there's about a bourbon. dozen. Bourbon whiskey. Really? Is yeah, bourbon. bourbon. It has to come from... Bourbon, from bourbon County. County. From Bourbon, bourbon County. County. Oh, okay. okay. It's true. And Chicago, um, Mexico has a, a patent, a patent or something, tequila. Actually, I think tequila, yes. Yeah. Yes, that's one of the... Uh, in the World Trade Organization. Yeah. Budweiser, Budweiser, uh, Czech Republic, is the original. You cannot sell Budweiser beer in the United States. You cannot sell Budweiser American beer uh -huh. in the Czech Republic. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, the Panama hat exporters. <laughs> Even though originally the name Bud Budweiser is from Budweiser, Czech Republic. Okay. <laughs> the, the Panama hat exporters, that is to say the exporters of sombreros de Baja Tokia, have banded together, which is something they very rarely do, and they want to get the World Trade Organization to define in the global, global marketplace that a Panama hat is a straw hat woven from Tokia straw in Ecuador. Because uh, you know, this probably says Shantung Panama. Uh, no, this, uh, Genuine Shantung Panama. Oh, yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> um, anyway, the hat exporters in Ecuador would like to get the World Trade Organization why to... Why do they call it Panama? Why do they call it Panama? Hmm. It's historical. It's, uh, it has to do with where the hats came from originally. Oh, yeah. on the name. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh why do they call it? Um, 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 yeah, why because they're, 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 uh, they're fooling people. There is a, uh, an intellectual property rights attorney in Quito, the very South American name of Bruce Horowitz, <laughs> who has uh, taken on this case. I don't know what stage it's at, but they're uh, they're working on it. The um, the hats themselves, of course, have uh, become very uh, you know flashy and very notable. We have very things. There was that that picture as I described earlier. The picture of Teddy Roosevelt wearing a, what they call a Panama hat on the <coughs> moving equipment at the canal. Um, who else contemporary? Tom Wolfe, Garrison Keillor, Albert Schweitzer. It's, it's just something that has, as the GQ guy said, a certain elan. You know, bank robbers do not wear Panama hats. Bank <laughs> presidents do. <coughs> there is, uh, of course, as in everything in a, a country such as Ecuador, rank exploitation involved in all of this. This is the country that, although it abolished slavery,
slavery in the 1800s had what they called wasipungo. It's a Quechua word. It means indentured servitude. And this stayed in Ecuador until 1964. <laughs> and the reason that they finally did away with it was the Alliance for Progress, which was a John Kennedy um, invention, was, uh, was a program didn't last very long, frankly, but what it did was it, it, it said, we'll loan you all sorts of money for almost anything you want. We'll lower the trades and tariffs on a lot of your products if you do things like end indentured, indentured servitude. So, in fact, uh, that's when that ended in Ecuador, but the, the ghost, the, 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 the phantoms of indentured servitude in the mountains of Ecuador still exist. There was, uh, in addition to that, there were all sorts of stories about who and how the hats affected. The hat weavers, the ones that do the really fine hats, will be leaning over a, sort of a tower of, so you don't have any up here now, the um, blocks. Oh, there's a photo. Thank you. Exhibit A. Uh, there'll be a tower of the uh, of hat blocks, and the, the weaver will be leaning over it. And it was thought, because so many of the weavers in so many of these towns were getting tuberculosis, this is in the 40s and 50s, that the hat industry was really creating, it was causing tuberculosis, which is a terrible thing to realize. And so there was a study done, and it turned out that it wasn't just the weavers, but almost everybody in these towns, even people who had nothing to do with the hat industry, these people were also getting tuberculosis. And the conclusion was that because the people from these particular towns were migrating to the coast for four months a year to work, they were bringing back a bug. They were bringing back a certain insect um, that caused the spread of tuberculosis. So this was, there are all these scares that go on over the years about uh, Panama hats and what they cause and don't cause. Um, I'm going to read a, a quick section here. I went, this is in the town of Pebre, or outside the town of Pebre Cordero. I went out with Domingo and a friend of his. Well, this is a uh, friend's name. I went out with, uh, yeah, with Domingo into the straw fields, looking for the origins, looking for the, the straw itself. We trudged another hour up and down steeper hills. Rain sprinkled lightly but steadily. Antagonistic mosquitoes joined us. They, the way grew more sloshy and humid. The muddy path was thick enough to suck the hind hoofs right off a bowl. <laughs> I took off my mud cape sneakers and carried them over my shoulder. My feet had never looked whiter than they did against the black South American clay. Domingo noticed my anxiety. It's right over there, he said, pointing at his piedra in the distance. We should be there soon. Piedra means rock, but it's the word they use for the, their machete that they cut the straw with. He said, we should be there soon. Soon. What does soon mean to someone who walks barefoot three hours a day to work in the morning and back again at night? For all I know, he went home for lunch, too. <laughs> soon. Distance and time are two of life's limitations that take on, little, take on surreal qualities in Latin America. Dimensions mean little. Soon. It could mean today, tonight, tomorrow, by next week, or I'm not sure. Soon could be 15 minutes or 15 miles. The difference between soon and forever might be negligible. A few minutes later, Domingo added, We're getting closer. We turned off the wide path and walked into a lush, sl sloping green forest with plants 10 or 20 feet high. The mosquitoes from the trail followed us. After 20 yards, Domingo stopped. There it is. There's the tokia straw. He clutched a slender green stalk rising 10 feet off the ground with thin green leaves spanning out two to three feet from the center at the top. Other shoots have not yet flowered and remain tightly wrapped inside their green leaf casing. Those were the ones we wanted. Domingo took his machete in his right hand, held an unopened shoot in his left, and sliced it off where it connected to the trunk. He did it again with another shoot and another and another and another. Antonio and the others took their machetes and did the same. In five minutes, we had a pile of some 50 shoots. Here, eight miles down a back road from a village at the end of a dirt road in South America's tropical northwest, I found the beginnings of the Panama hat. Uh, 
they take the straw, they send it back to their villages, hung on a clothesline. Um, the group I went with put the straw on some donkeys they had with them. And uh, we walked, and the, donkey, the straw was on the donkeys, not us. Um, and that's what they do just about uh, every month, month after month, year after year, for their entire life. These people, they do have compulsory education up through sixth grade, and if they have relatives in other towns where there are schools that go beyond sixth grade, sometimes one child in each family will go to a higher, higher level. Um, there's not a whole lot of feeling about what happens to the hats once they leave, you know, to, what happens to the straw once it leaves the straw cutter town, or what happens to the hats once it leaves the weaver's hands. And I did find a poem in the town of Monte Cristi by a fellow named Lupi. It's a little four stanza poem. El Sombrero de Monte Cristi, a wondrous fiber known to the world under an assumed name, artful propaganda of poorly paid silent labor, the peacocking of pampered people, a wellspring fertile and enduring of misfortune to the poor and extravagance of the wealthy. A fine warp, a painstaking marble that transforms the straw into exquisite high fashion. The holocaust of a people who naively sponsor a pitiful way of life, bound into sheaves of trampled misery. This is one of the straw cutters being, uh, talking about his business. Um, when, a, when a weaver finishes with a hat, it really isn't finished the way we think of it. It's, it's got all the loose ends. The outer rim is not sewn together. Um, it, looks, it looks like a bad wig with a lot of hair coming out. And, you know, they'll clutch part of the hat by the straw, and that will be the, um, sort of like holding a cat almost by the tail. So they take it to, in the town I spent a great deal of time, Julian, they take their hats, the weavers take their hats, to a fellow named Adriano Gonzalez. Gonzalez is mestizo, which is to say much lighter skin. He's, you know, he wears a sport jacket. He's six foot tall, which is about twice as much as most of the week. Not twice, but a good deal taller. And the difference between him and the weavers is extraordinary. For hours, it seemed, virtually every woman and some men who live in the canton of Biblian approached Senor Gonzalez to sell them their newly woven hats. At his mercy for their weekly kittens, they stood in small bunches, some silent, others chattering, a few solemn, and a couple drunk. I walked around front to get a weaver's eye view. From their side of the table, Gonzalez's slender six-foot frame grew another foot. From this vantage point, he clearly had the upper hand. In fact, he had the only hand. His eyes, his skin tone, his clothes, his home, his gender, his vocabulary, his height, his wallet, all these gave him every advantage. <coughs> Many weavers chewed raw sugar cane while waiting in line. Their teeth, or what was left of them, <coughs> excuse me, uh, their teeth, or what was left of them, were as yellow as their hats. I asked a small cluster of women how long it had taken them to weave their hats. How many hours? Who knows? We don't figure time in hours, they replied. So Gonzalez, at the, end of the, at the end of a day, one day a week, usually on Sunday, he will collect the hats from all over the canton of Biblion. And he used to, back when I first saw him in 1982, he would get 10,000 hats a week. When I last saw him about five years ago, he was getting 1,500 hats a week. <coughs> he takes them to the factories. He sells the hats at a certain markup, his profit margin. He pays anywhere from about 50 cents to two dollars a hat to the weavers, to the unfinished hats. Unless it's unless he's commissioned a real a real fino. There are certain weavers he has who he supplies the straw to, and he has a separate arrangement with them. But for most of the women who spend their days, you know, taking care of their babies or a flock of sheep, um, and they'll do three or four hats over the course of a week. He'll pay them, as I said, anywhere from maybe 50 cents to a few dollars. He then um, takes these in the back of his Jeep to the hat factories and sells them bulk. 
uh, there's one hat factory where in the room that he delivers them to, there's a poster of the Disney dog, Pluto, and the caption says, Pluto is equal to Gluta. <laughs> so, uh, some of the dumb bilingual jokes, I'm sorry. Um, there are other ways that hats come north. Um, and you may well have this here. Do you have sailors come in now and then? With the, it used to be quite prevalent, actually. Well, we have all kinds of people coming through. Who've been in Ecuador. Ecuador. Peace Corps volunteers. Peace Corps volunteers, Jehovah's Witnesses, <laughs> uh, people who travel through the country who come in and want to uh, sell us their Panama hats. Mm -hmm. but Sometimes. Uh -huh. um, I don't know how much it's done now, but it, it used to be, uh, I mean, having sailors come in for hat shops in port cities such as San Diego was common. <laughs> They had been at, at uh, Puerto Bolivar, which is the port for the White Hill area, actually, down here. And they would pick up very nice Panama hats and sell them to the stores here and in San Francisco. I want to uh, say, let's get, let's get the slides in now. Let's, uh, I've talked it up about some of these people. Let's see what they, see what they look like. Should I do something with the lighting, or? Probably. Let's see.
she's she working on. Have they ever up and tried to unionize these people? They have. On many times, there have been efforts to make a syndicate, a guild, a union. Um, it simply doesn't work. They don't have the. Uh, they never stay together long enough.
you know, almost everything in Ecuador, I, I've always measured by sucres, which has been their currency since uh, their patriot sucre died about 200, 300 years ago. But within the last 10 years, Ecuador has, their economy was in free fall. So they didn't just pay their economy to the dollar, they adopted the dollar. The U.S. dollar is the currency within Ecuador. So everything there, the people are paid in in nickels, dimes, quarters, and dollars. And uh, there are no more sucres there, except I'm told way out in the campo, I don't know if word has reached them yet, but way out in the campo, they still use sucres. Um, the, the daughter, Monica, who we saw there in, in different positions, was um, is, is actually, uh, her father had said, I, I had it wrong, I said 14 or 15 years. He claimed it takes 25 years you know, to learn how to weave the real pinot, but he's also the sort of fellow that says we're almost there, we'll be there soon. That this, <laughs> quantifying something is not, is not their strength. <clears throat> One of the American cultural phenomena of the last generation had a major effect on the Panama hat industry, and that was urban cowboy. The Stetson and Musistol Company would make a great deal of straw cowboy hats. And most of the hats they made at the time were made from Ecuadorian straw. Um, for example, Gonzalez would tell his weavers he wanted real big ones. And the, the Musistol Company, for example, had, they had three factories going 24 hours a day. They just couldn't make enough of these big cowboy hats. The whole urban cowboy phenomenon turned the Panama hat industry into, uh, you know, into something where anybody who was connected with it was profiting by it. And as, as the head of marketing said, as we just all told me, the bigger and the uglier they were, the more we sold. And this cultural phenomenon gave a real shot in the arm for about five or six years to the Panama hat industry. And then it just, like, as all cultural phenomena, just took a dive. Um, it, they really exploited that as best they could, but um, there were two things that they like in the industry and don't like about John Kennedy. One was that he brought about the Alliance for Progress, which of course was good, because um, it lowered and eliminated the tariff on, on straw hat bodies, as they're called. They export the bodies, not the finished hats. But of course, he also was well known for going hatless, which had a major effect on the hat trade. Uh, it's uh, also the car industry. The cars were lower and the roofs were lower, and so you couldn't wear a hat as you were sitting in the front seat as you once could, or it was much harder. So you know, they keep hoping that somebody like Tiger Woods or Jennifer Lopez will be wearing a, a Panama for a week or two at a time and get, you know, give it a much higher profile. There is a group in an environmental group in the city of Guayaquil called Fundacion Natura, the Nature Foundation. They did a study and they concluded that since the campesinos kept going further back into the deforested countryside in order to find the mature cuttable straw, that the plant, like the hat, uh, may eventually become endangered. So what uh, Fundacion Natura did was they are helping the growers plant new acreage of the straw, so it won't be the wild straw they go after. They will have managed harvest, um, and it, it should bring about the survival. It should bring about uh, more straw and better quality straw, and they're still experimenting with that. The, um, the export figures keep going down for Ecuador, and it means the price here maintains or goes up somewhat. The, um, the fellow who I, uh, when I was following the initial trail back uh, 15, 16, 17 years ago, the fellow who ended up with that one hat that I was following actually is a pest control executive here in San Diego. Ray Stansbury is not here tonight, I don't suppose. We've invited him. No? Okay. Um, the, uh, excuse me? The, uh, the way that one gets around Ecuador uh, obviously depends on how much money you have, who you are, and, and uh, what resources, what, what transportation resources there are. I'm 
to finish with uh, what I call the bus plunge highway. This is a section of uh, anyone who's ridden buses in Latin America will identify with this. I was going to the town of Febres Cordero, and I took the bus to Guayaquil, which at that time had 1.6 million people, now considerably more. It's a 150-mile ride. Bus rides through Latin America have always induced fear in me, brought on by years of reading one paragraph bus plunge stories used by newspapers in the States as fillers on the foreign news page. The date lines change, but the headlines always include the word bus plunge, as in well by Sri Lanka bus plunge, Chilean bus plunge kills 31. We can count on one every couple of days or so, an editor at the New York Times once told me. They're always ready when we need them. Never more than two or three sentences long, a standard bus plunge story will usually include the number of beer dead, the identity of the group on board, a soccer team, a church choir, um, and the distance of the plunge from the capital city. The words ravine and gorge pop up often. Most of the stories come from third world countries, the victims constituting just a fraction of the faceless, brown-skinned masses. There's a, a book by a foreign correspondent named Mort Rosenblum. A hundred Pakistanis going off a mountain, Mort wrote, in a bus, makes less of a story than three Englishmen drowning in the Thames. Is there a news service that does nothing but supply papers with bus plunge stories? <laughs> Peru and India seem to generate the most coverage. Perhaps the wire services have more stringers in the Andes and the Himalayas than anywhere else. If an Ecuadorian bus driver survives a plunge fatal to others, according to Moritz Thompson in his book Living Poor, quote, he immediately goes into hiding in some distant part of the country so that the bereaved can't even up the score. There are rumors of whole villages in the far reaches of the Amazon basin populated almost entirely by bus drivers. <laughs> I was in San Diego bus driver. <laughs> if you anticipate a bus trip through Latin America, <clears throat> go through the following checklist prior to boarding it. Look at the tires, check the windshield wipers, if the wiper that works is on the driver's side, so much the better. <laughs> the shrines to saints and pious homilies and boastful bumper stickers and religious trinkets do not reflect the safety of a bus. Jesus Christ and Che Guevara are often worshipped on the same decal. This should give you neither high hopes nor nagging suspicion. The driver's sobriety is not a factor. The presence of his wife or girlfriend is. If she's along, she will usually sit immediately behind him next to him or on his lap. He will want to impress her with his daring at the wheel, but he will also want to go to great lengths not to injure her. If he has no girlfriend or wife, the chances of gorge dive increase. <laughs> Check the bus for brakes. Once I asked a driver in Guatemala about the brakes on his bus. Look, he said, the bus has stopped, isn't it? Then the brakes must work. Always have your passport ready. Random military inspections take place whenever you least expect them. In defense of Latin American buses, they go everywhere. No road is so dusty, bumpy, <laughs> unpopulated, narrow, or obscure that a bus doesn't rumble down it at least once every 24 hours. The fare is really very little. Cuenca to Guayaquil costs less than $3. And barring plunges, they almost always reach their destination. If your window opens, you'll get a view of the countryside unmatched in painting or postcard. Your seatmate might be an aging campesina on her way home or a youthful Indian on his first trip to the big city. Dialects of Spanish and Quechua, unknown to linguists, float past you. Chickens, piglets, and children crowd the aisles. My trip, five and a half hours long, began at 8,400 feet above sea level. It climbed so much higher and descended to a sea level straightaway for the final 90 minutes. The advantage of the drive towards Guayaquil from Cuenca is that the precipitous ravine usually falls off on the left side of the two-lane road. The disadvantage is that you're headed downhill most of the way. For the better part of the first hour, we followed a cattle truck which moved only slightly faster than its cargo could have managed on its own. <laughs> the cattle turned off at the village of Asojes and we pushed on deep into the province of Cañar. The temperature dropped. I looked out the left side onto the clouds surrounding peaks nearby and distant. The thin air above the clouds and the Andes gave the sunlight colors unknown below. Only occasionally did our driver attempt a suicide squeeze and we settled into a quiet passage. Food signs advertised local cheeses. Small piles of tokia straw lay on the ground near doorless houses where women sat in the entrances weaving Panama hats. 
Julio, the driver, knew all the potholes and bumps on the road and managed to hit every one. <coughs> we descended into the thick of the clouds and Julio downshifted. The white line down the center of the curving two-lane road was his only guide. Even the bus's hood ornament had disappeared into the clouds. After five minutes, he slowed down and then stopped. Pepe walked through the aero taxi, that is the bus, collecting money. I nudged the fellow next to me. What's this for? We're at the shrine, he said. Each driver stops at this shrine along the way and leaves some money. It's their way of asking God's blessing for a safe journey. Often the saints are next to a police checkpoint, so the driver can make two payoffs at once. <laughs> Pepe trotted across the road to leave our money at the shrine, when suddenly a half dozen Indian faces appeared out of the clouds, pressing against the windows. Chocolos, chocolos, yes, cada uno. They were selling sweet corn cooked with onion, cheese, and egg, called choclos, for slightly more than 10 cents each. Two barefoot Indian women in felt hats and thick mud-stained ponchos slipped onto the bus and walked up and down the aisle. Chocolos, chocolos, nueve cada uno. The price had gone down some. Another vendor with a glazed look in her eye and a baby in her arms wrapped desperately on a window, trying to get a passenger to open it. Her shrill voice seemed as distant as her eyes. Pepe that returned, and the Indians withdrew into the Indian mist. Bus drivers' assistants throughout Latin America displayed keen skills of hopping on and off moving buses, keeping track of which passenger is due, how much change for his fare, pumping gas, climbing through a window to the roof to retrieve some freight before the bus stops, and changing blowouts. Pepe performed all these feats in the course of the run to Guayaquil and excelled at hopping on the bus when it was already in second gear. Trotting a pace of the bus, he first took a sharp, uh, short skirt. Excuse me. Trotting a pace of the bus, he first took a short skip on the ground to get the spring in his feet. Then a short jump up at 45 degree angle, calculated to land him on the first step while he grasped the metal bar next to the doorway. His motion appeared so fluid and effortless, he seemed to be simply stepping onto a bus in repose. The ride down the western face of the Andes settled into a relatively peaceful journey once the tire was changed and the saint paid off. We went through a long stretches where the only hint of life was an occasional chosa, a straw-thatched hut, set back from the road. Valleys with streams and rivers flowing towards the Pacific held small towns. Our descent to sea level was practically complete, and we entered a different climate, province, and culture. Riding the saint at work, we had passed the bus plunge zone safely. Um, I guess I'll close just by saying that, you know, to me, the, the story of this somewhat rapish hat, um, it still has many generations to go. Um, to the wearer and, and to the admirer of these hats, the Ecuadorian straw hat conveys, uh, conveys an easygoing sense of confidence, a dash of elan. For me, when I think about it every month on the waning quarter moon, I think of the path of these remarkable hats and how it goes from sea to sail. And if I'm wearing my Panama, I tip it towards the equator. Thank you.
more about the distinction. Um, the dents, that's what I call them, on the sides and the front. Is that um, relevant to a certain locale, origin, style, and room width, too? Could you address that? That's, um, that's almost entirely determined by the marketplace. It's, that's going from the far end backwards. So um, I followed an order from resist all hats going backwards, and I followed the straw from the forward. We met at a certain point. The um, resist all for the year following I did my trip had asked for uh, a wider brim. And this word trickled down to people like Adriano Gonzalez, who there's one like him in every town. And so he would tell the weavers, I want a wider brim. You know, I was going to ask you about colors, but I obviously I noticed in that photograph that they came in variety of colors. Yet I wasn't aware of that. Why are, do we Why have any examples of no colors? Purple here? and red, and green, camel. Most of those are exported to other countries. But well, you can see if you look on, on the wall over there, you've got black, tan, bleach. You okay. Got, now over here on this tree to Tom's left, you'll see yeah. various shades of. of Coffee, tan, green. I see, but no purples, no red. Well, I don't, you know, I mean, there's not much of a market for purple no, and red. No, pink or blue. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> in the past years, I just can't pull one out for you right now. Yeah, we had a purple one right up there. Where's this first? Top. Oh, right up there. Yeah, this is a crochet panama. This is something. Oh, crochet panama. They crochet the straw uh, before they begin to weave it, and you'll see a couple of colors there along the lines of what you're asking. Is that the yeah. paint problem? about the colors. Um, a lot of the colors go into places that you can order blanks from, like he talked about the blanks, the bodies, mm -hmm. and they go into fashion land, mm -hmm. and um, people make different shaped hats out of them. Okay, those. so they're blocked accordingly and decorated. Mm -hmm. or exactly. Okay. Yeah, the hat body can be you know, stretched in, and you can do almost anything if it really you have the right equipment. Um, second question. Now, the hats, the imitation ones from China, from Shantung province, are the, no, from Shantung, called Shantung, are they from Shandong province? I don't know. Because that, um, I was a Chinese studies minor in college, and Shandong is the, Shantung is actually a corruption of Shandong, which was the old German colony in China. Probably the best known city there is Qingdao, or Qingdao, like a beer. But uh, there's a type of silk fabric called Shantung silk. Yeah. That and makes sense. I, I, it, mm -hmm. I didn't know. I know it's, it's a twisted rice paper right. that comes from that is exported from Japan to China. Okay. And they use that for the, the making. And the, maybe they're from Shantung. The geography. Maybe it has the texture of Shantung. Right. That's a possibility too. Yeah. I mean, these are really cool. So, um, so they're not wearing the peasants are not wearing these hats. Like we use well, they, it, um, in the Andes, it's extremely cool, but in the, in the midday sun, when you're at that altitude, the air is so thin that the sun will affect you, and so the, there's good reason to be wearing a hat. So the tighter weave of the pheno, <coughs> does that actually keep you cooler? Than it's the, it's the opposite. I would think the, yeah, it is the opposite. You want, you want an open weave? A very tightly woven hat is actually quite warm, yeah. in warm way. Yeah. Yeah. That's why they punch holes in the side. And they have Speaking of punching holes in the side, uh, one of the reasons that Resistol does not buy Ecuadorian straw hats much anymore is that U.S. Customs would on occasion take what amounts to a metal hose and right through a stack of hats and pull out a plug because they had heard that people were soaking the hats in cocaine and this was just another clever way of importing drugs to the United States. <laughs> well, when the hats got to the Resistol company, they all had a hole in them. Oh, no. And so they were not very fond of continually importing, continuing to import these hats uh, that had to go through U.S. Customs. Did you ever have that? It would be a way. I'm not right It doesn't get to me. I mean, it's not that my vendors Right. Just that's right. Yeah. Sure. You might have some pretty expensive hats here, but... Is there an interest with the younger generations carrying on the traditions? 
Yeah, I wouldn't say interest. It isn't it like they have much choice. Yeah. Um, as I said, it's, it's, it's a 19th century industry there and 21st century marketing here and in Europe. And there's not a whole lot in common. There's not a whole lot of connect point there. So, yes, the children are doing it. Now, they are branching out. Sometimes they're weaving these little, little straw figurines or placemats. Um, because it will take them less time and they can make as much money doing those. But, um, yeah, there is another generation of the weavers. They're just, the, you know, the real master weavers. There are not as many of them coming along, that's for sure. Do you suppose that China will try to flood the market with the Shandongs? Are they doing that? They're doing, doing the that? best they can. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, they sell extremely well. Yes, no. Then you're yeah, they're, they're less expensive. Uh, you know, a Panama can be somewhat temperamental. You have to uh, understand and appreciate what you're buying when you're buying a Panama hat. A Shantung, as Tom was explaining, is just not subject uh, uh, to, to the same issues that a, that a Panama would be. I mean, it, it, uh, you know, somebody will come in here sometime and they'll, they'll be traveling and they'll say, uh, you know, well, should I take this Panama hat? And I, and, I, and I have to kind of caution them that it's possible that if the hat's blocked and finished, not the kind that roll up in the, in the box, mm -hmm. but once it's gotten taken by a factory, like Tom suggested, resist all as an example, and blocked and stiffened and shellac, mm -hmm. and that hat doesn't travel very well. It can crack, potentially, if it's abused. You have to handle the hat by the brim. You have to put it down carefully. You don't want to pinch the crown too much, or it, it very well might break. Whereas a Shantung... And it's an ordinary moody Yeah, the Shantung is just more durable. Mm -hmm. But it just it doesn't... I mean, we have to appreciate um, the work that goes into a Panama. It's, 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 it's a craft, art. And appreciate it on that basis. Someone, someone asked a minute ago about this, the next generation. Um, the few children from the, you know, the hat weavers families that do go on into higher education, there was one I met, uh, when I first met her, she was just finishing up her master's thesis at a university in Cuenca. Her name was Maria Leonora Aguilar de Tamaris, and eventually her master's thesis became this book, Weaving, uh, Weaving for Life, Weaving the Life, uh, Tejiendo la Vida. The Artisans of Papa Sofia, of the Sofia Straw in Ecuador. And it's a whole book about the phenomenon of weaving the hats. And a lot of the history and you know, the charts on you know, cultivators, the producers, the wholesalers, the retailers, the straw cutters, the whole, you know, they understand much better than we do. Um, another hat uh, published by the National Bank, the Central Bank of Ecuador, the history and the economy of the hats. They take this quite seriously there, because it's one of their uh, best-known exports. One or two other questions? Why is the most uh, assumption made, I guess, of the black band for a Panama hat? Is that As some, opposed to some something more band. colorful? Or, um, I guess it's standard. I, I don't know. Yeah. I think just for showing off the brightness of the hat. It almost makes yeah. it look like you feel it like you had to be dressed in yeah. full rather than wearing a bandana with some color in it. I mean, some people will, you know, once they get the hat, they'll, you know, they'll put in there, they'll put a, maybe put a feather in there or mm -hmm. something very colorful. Or, or um, I like maroon bands myself. Or it's a woven band. Okay. Well, yeah. uh, thanks. Very good.